inside is already fast inside. Once again, welcome. Right now we have Will Woods and Jen Giardino presenting Cockpit Composer, building OS images for any platform. Hey. All right, let's see. Oh, hey, my microphone works, yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Will Woods. Uh, I'm, oh, and I'm a senior software engineer, apparently. I am, that's true, that's not a lie. Yeah, and I'm Jen Giardino, Senior Interaction Designer on the UXD team at Red Hat. And we also have a guest speaker, Jacob. <laughs> it's all about the hot dog. Um, so welcome to our talk. Image Builder is tooling to enable the creation of customized OS images. It includes both a graphical UI and a CLI, and um, it takes uh, contents like RHEL and Fedora, along with custom contents, third-party contents, and it enables you to create image, image files for a variety of deployment types. And currently, we are using um, existing tooling for our backend builder, and we'll talk more about that in, later in the presentation. The image types that we initially supported were live bootable images, standard Linux, virtual machine images, and raw disk images. And then in RHEL 8, we introduced initial support for hybrid cloud image types. And we plan to add more cloud image types in future releases. The images you build with Image Builder are built based on these things we call blueprints. So blueprints are where you define what packages you want to include in your image, um, along with basic customizations like host name and users with passwords or SSH keys. So I'm going to take you, a, take you through a demo of the current functionality that we have in the UI. And um, just wanted to... Uh, let you know that, uh, let me log out and start over so you can kind of see the full experience. Um, but on my machine, I have a VM running RHEL 8, and on that machine I have the packages for Cockpit and Composer already installed. So I don't know if you're familiar with um, Cockpit, we refer to that as the RHEL web console, and um, Cockpit Composer, we refer to that as Image Builder. So um, to, uh, the web console is a way that I can access that machine using a web-based UI. So I'm going to log in to the web console. And because I have the packages for Image Builder installed, I also see Image Builder display in my left-hand navigation here. And when I navigate to the Image Builder, I first see a list of all the blueprints that I have access to. The blueprints that you see that start with example are blueprints that we provide out of the box when you install Image Builder. Um, and then I can also create additional blueprints for the images that I want to create. For this demo, I'm going to modify the blueprint named example HTTP server. And first, I'm going to modify the packages in that blueprint. Um, so on this page, you can see we have two panels. The panel on the left displays all of the contents that I have access to based on the repositories that I have defined on my system. And then the panel on the right shows me what contents I will be including in the image files that I create based off of this blueprint. And this panel is divided into two separate tabs. So the first tab is selected components. These are all the items that I have explicitly selected to be included in this image file. And then the, the dependencies are the things that we automatically pull in based on those items to, that you selected. So the first modification I want to make to this blueprint is to remove a couple of packages. And so I don't know if you were paying attention to the numbers on these tabs, but if I, if I roll back those changes, you can see that as I was changing the packages um, that I included, that the number of dependencies also um, got updated because it's automatically resolving those dependencies as I change those contents. Uh, the easiest way to find packages that you're looking for in the UI is to filter the list. So I'm going to filter by Node.js, and I'm going to add this package to my blueprint. If I click the Add um, 
icon here, it will automatically pull in the, the latest version of that package. But I could also click on that, that list item and view the component details for that package to be a little more specific about which version of that package I want to pull in. Um, but for this, I'm just going to take the latest version of that package and add it to my blueprint. And I also want to make sure that I have NPM included in this image, so I'm just going to filter the list of packages in my, blue, in my blueprint. And you can see that I haven't explicitly selected it here, but it is um, showing up as a dependency. So when I pulled in Node.js, it automatically pulled NPM in for me. So as I've been making all of these changes, they've been um, captured here in this pending changes uh, modal. So I can see these are all the changes that I've made during this current session. And uh, when I'm ready to, to save them, I can go ahead and hit the commit button. And now those changes are saved in the blueprint. Before I create an image um, with these updates in my blueprint, I also want to just go and check the customizations that I have. So in the, the slide that I shared, we support more um, customization settings than are currently available in the UI. So right now we just have the host name and the users. Um, we're currently working on adding those other customizations into the UI. Um, but here I can go ahead and add a host name, and I can add another user. And um, I can either provide an SSH key or a password. For this, I'll just create a password and hope that I type it the same way each time. <laughs> And so now I have the extra user in this blueprint, and when I create the image, it'll include those package changes and the um, customization settings that I included. Currently, these are the, the different image types that we support that we can create images for. Um, for this, I'm just going to select a QMU image type and start that. And um, all of the images that I've created for this blueprint get listed under the images tab. So you can see that this, um, this image is the one that I just now added to the queue. These are other image files that I've previously created for this blueprint. So that's all we're going to show for the demo. Um, next, we're going to take you through um, I guess first, what does Image Builder not do? So we create those image files. Um, image Builder does not deploy those images for you, and, and Image Builder is not going to manage those deployments. So that's something that we're working with, how Image Builder integrates with other products to help you with that complete workflow. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and then uh, we wanted to talk about some of the things that we're currently working on for Image Builder. Um, so including additional image types, I obviously didn't update my slide to remove Google. That's one that, that was there um, during the demo, but Hyper-V, IBM, Alibaba. And then also the, um, the features that we're currently working on is the ability to upload to the cloud. So taking those image files that are for Amazon and Azure and being able to upload them, um, but not deploy them. Just go ahead and get them there so that you can then take them further and, and do what you need to with them in that context. And then um, also some of the things that we're working on in terms of how we're building those images. And then um, some of the current challenges we have with those configurations that um, people currently use with kickstarts that we're trying to figure out how we can incorporate into our build process. So uh, Jacob it has been working on the feature for uploading image files to the cloud, so he's going to spend some time taking you through the work that he's been doing there. So as Jen just demonstrated, we are currently able to create an image, um, and that will allow you to download the image, and you can handle it yourself. However, we are currently working on allowing users to, when they select an image type, they will also be given the option to upload that image to the cloud providers that the image supports. So in this instance, we can select that we're going to upload it to Azure, and alongside that, we will now provide uh, the ability, you will enter all your credentials, and like where you want the image to go and then we'll prepare it for you 
and we'll upload the image and it'll be ready to run on that cloud provider. We won't handle the first boot for you yet, but we will allow you, it will be ready to run on the provider and it'll be uploaded to where you set it under your user. Um, after creating an upload, you'll then be able to view the uploads you've created for each image. Um, and so, for instance, if you have a satellite upload or like an Azure upload or an AWS upload for a particular image type, you'll see all those uploads that you've pushed for that image. Now, and I believe that code is, uh, has that been merged? Uh, not yet. It's about to go through the pre-R process and should be, uh, should be live soon. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, here I'm going to talk a little bit about OS build, um, where we're sort of redoing the back end pieces of uh, this, because Anaconda is a wonderful, wonderful tool, but it was designed to, well, Neil shaking his head does not think it's a wonderful tool, apparently. Um, I'm not going to argue with you. Uh, it's very good at some of the things that it is supposed to do, and it's, you know, it's the one thing that we know can make bootable images and do it correctly we figure maybe there should be another tool. Um, because it really doesn't want to work the way we want to use it. It's designed for installing a image, or installing a system. It wants to run on the system that it's setting up. And it gets really confused and gnarly. So OS build, um, and this uh, UI here is not, this is a mock-up. Um, but part of what we're trying to do there is make builds be reproducible. Um, so when you do your initial image build, you get a you know you get a manifest out essentially uh, or something like that. You get a list of the exact package versions that were used in that build. And if you know a week later you wanna you're like hey that was you know we did the, that QCow image is great uh, now I want an AMI of that. Um, there can be some problems because of the way that uh, in Fedora the way our repos work. Some of the packages you used in that build might have gone away. So um, OS build is going to, or part of what it needs to do is handle that problem by you know, caching all of the data that get used in the images and sort of uh, associating them with one another. So we have this concept of a compose, which is basically um, it's one point in time of that blueprint and all of the things you built from it. So there's some challenges around how to make that safe and reproducible and reliable. Um, so yeah, there's a project called OS Build that we're doing that's basically a uh, staged image builder. It's, I think, on the, yeah, it's a new build system for us images. It doesn't really change a lot of the image builder stuff that we have. It's just sort of this one new backend component. So it's not um, super disruptive to what we have, but it's going to allow us to do a lot more reliable builds, probably faster um, and um, and faster, easier, more reliable, that sort of thing. Um, I don't remember uh, if there's another slide on here. Oh, yes. So the other thing that is interesting about OS Build and one of the challenges that we have here, <clears throat> why we have our own customizations, and you know we're not just using Kickstarter or Ansible, is that when you're building images, you're running on, you're not running on the system that's the final target. So there's a lot of things that we can't do, we just can't bake into your image because it's not running in its intended environment yet. So we can put things in the image, but they don't get set up until the first boot when it's actually live. Um, but the way everybody does everything these days is, well, you know, from what I've seen, and we would love it if you tell us otherwise, Everybody has enormous kickstart scripts with enormous post scripts that do a million weird things to set up their images in various ways. And they never really tell us what happens in there, but it's very, very important that we support all of it. Um, and that doesn't really work with the image, build, image builder model of how images should get built. We want that to be reliable and you know, not involve spinning up an entire VM or running all of this hardware. We should be building images like you compile code, where you take a bunch of inputs and you get output, but you don't have to run an entire VM to do it. So the model that we have today with Kickstart and Ansible is that you're running a whole bunch of code in the image to build, to have it sort of build itself from the inside. Um, that doesn't really work. It's not predictable. It's not reliable. Um, it's really hard to troubleshoot what goes on in those things. Um, and some, it's just like, sometimes people just do really, really wild stuff in there. Because it's shell scripts, they can do literally anything. And sometimes you see very interesting things happening that 
like shouldn't be allowed. The police should come if you're if you're doing the sorts of things I have seen in people's kickstarts. So the, one of the themes of what we're working on here is to try to make image building a first class use case of our packaging and um, installation toolkit. So it does kind of mean we have to lay out stages. So OS build does very strict stages of like you get a file system, you do some stuff to it, and then the next stage gets you know gets a file system and some con uh, configuration. But they don't share anything else between them. We're not necessarily running code inside the image. It's doing things to the image. Um, so that's sort of there. Is, so there is a different model of building than the one that we're used to, and so we can't just say, "Yeah, we support Kickstart because that's on the you're going to run this in place model." So these are the things we're trying to figure out: is how to do a good job of doing the customization things for your images, what you need to get done, but not just let you have like the big box where you put all of your crazy shell scripts and then like it catches fire and we don't know what happened. Um, we would like to give you good tools to do the things you need to do. So yeah, um, I think that there's an activity with the UX team. Um, oh yeah, yeah, we have we have document. Yeah, it has documentation. We did good. Yay. Um, this is our upstream for Lorax Composer and all of this. It's in RHEL 7.6 and RHEL 8 and Fedora. Um, and yes, if you want to try these things out, um, you can just DNF install Cockpit Composer. There's an Ansible playbook um, that will install it for you on you know, everything. Um, and yeah, so the, the UX, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you guys are going to be around tomorrow, I don't know if you've noticed, we have a UXD booth out in the lobby. Um, we have a couple of activities that we're doing related to RHEL. So this first one is Image Builder. It's a card sword activity. Um, we would love to have you come by and participate in that activity to help us with refining the UI. Um, also, the, the current challenges we have with customizations, if customizations are important to you, we would also love to just talk with you in um, more depth about those customizations and, and how you use them. Um, so just come find us and we'd love to chat with you. And then also, um, so Sarah's involved in uh, the card sword activity and then also she has a, an activity not really related to Image Builder but just related to RHEL. It's a top tasks survey. So if you are around tomorrow, please come by and take that survey for us. Um, and that's it. Do you guys have any questions for us? Um, I'll take the first one. I, I, I'll pass the mic oh. around, so uh, keep your hands up. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Um, so yeah, a, as people raise their hands, I'll be bringing the mic directly to you. If you happen to be in the middle of a row, it'd be helpful if you try to move to the end. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, though, because this slot technically goes till 535. Yeah. Mm. Oh boy. <laughs> Let's wrap, y'all. So, I definitely like where you're going with the OS build thing because the, the, the thing before was painful. Uh, uh, so, what did you look at for inspiration to try to figure out the uh, strategy and approach of how you wanted um, this new way of building images to work? Because it seems to have shades of some of the other tools that I've worked on and contributed to, and some of it is kind of different. So, I mean, wh where, where did you draw inspiration from? Um, you know, I didn't actually start the, um, the OS build project, uh, so uh, I don't, I think that was um, mostly Kai, Sievers, and, um, and Lars, how did you say Lars' last name? Karlitsky. Karlitsky, yeah. I say Tom's last name. Um, and yeah, Tom Gunderson. Um, so I should ask them about that, but um, I, I think mostly it's just this is the obviously sane way to do something like an image build is to break it down into like repeatable steps and make sure that you know exactly what the inputs and outputs are of those steps. You know, the uh, the, the uh, inspiration was trying to make code not suck. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not. I'm not working on that because I'm definitely much more of a front-end developer. Um, the main understanding I have is that Anaconda wasn't built to do this type of thing, and so we need a, a new and better um, image build uh, application or tool to do that for us. And and so they they want to make it easier to troubleshoot and easier to understand like what's happening in each stage of that process. So it should be like a much cleaner way of creating these images so that you can kind of 
and, and providing logs for that whole process. You can understand exactly what's happening. That's my understanding. I, I, actually, I can't I can, make promises. I can add a little bit to this. So, um, so we're compartmentalizing each stage of the image build process so that way they aren't interacting with each other and then you can kind of keep track along each stage where you are and if it errors at any point, you'll be able to get logs for that particular stage and it will the errors will only be related to that stage and then if you are trying to debug it, you'll be able to start again from that stage in the image build process. Um, we're kind of keeping track of the file system through uh, tree sums, which each stage will generate. So the, as Will said, you have an input and an output to each stage, and you should ideally have the input. If you give it the same input, you'll get the same output no matter what time it is if you build it from a specific input now and a specific input in that same input a year from now, it should give you the same output since we're compartmentalizing each stage. If there's like package changes in some repository you use, that shouldn't affect the build process outside of that one package you use. Right. Yeah, we want each step of the process to be not quite deterministic, but like close to deterministic. And that's kind of a big problem with a lot of the existing stuff because, yeah, the repos change every day. If you run the same Kickstart script two days in a row, you don't get the same image out necessarily. And that's something that really we need to address. And it turns out we, there's some deep assumptions in the sort of RPM ecosystem um, that we have to get people to rethink. Um, like, packages shouldn't just disappear just because there's a newer version. Like, that's not great for, yeah. Um, I mean, if it's critically broken, yeah, we should revoke it or whatever. Your, your build should fail if we had to revoke a package because it was critically broken. But in general, we shouldn't be doing that. So there's some things we have to do with how repositories are structured. So there's some like weird, deep things we need to do in and around um, the RPM ecosystem to make image building like reliable and predictable. And so there's a lot of weird work that's a cousin to these things that we're going to be doing. But uh, OS build is sort of where it starts, um, back end wise, anyway. And then, so in, in the front end, um, some of the advantages we would get with this new OS build is, uh, in this example, um, you can see the the first item we have is, I don't know what we're going to call it, like in this mock-up, it's the compose, but Will had said manifest, but it's like those those package files that are going into your, your image file. So at first, I create um, a specific image file type, like for Amazon, um, after this OS build process, then like two weeks, a month later, I could choose to create the exact same image but for Azure and I can see like these are all the image files I've created for that um, that compose or that manifest and then also with the work that Jacob's doing where you can take then take that image file and upload it somewhere being able to then see these are all the uploads that I've kicked off from this image file and then for each of those things being able to access the logs so for the the OS build and then for the image file creation and then also for the upload so being able to know exactly like what's happening at each stage of that process. Next question. I'm going to pass the microphone, but I've been asked to uh, remind everyone here. Uh, uh, we still have plenty of time for questions, but when we do finish questions, I've been asked to remind everyone to please uh, clear the conference room completely and also move out of the Ziskin Lounge, basically the whole space. We need to vacate for a period of time. Uh, it's recommended that you maybe get dinner, and uh, the party is going to be at 7 p.m., I believe, in the Terrace Lounge. Um, also, I was asked to remind you that you can still sign up for Lightning Talks. They're going to take sign-ups during the party, I think. So this is great. We had long discussions about this earlier. Um, so a couple things occurred to me while you know the talk that I'd like to ask if you've considered. The first is um, you talked about targeting various cloud providers, and one of the trickiest parts I've found in producing images for cloud providers is the stage you kind of alluded to. You talked about the problems with running Kickstarter or all that first, which is how do I configure this once it gets launched, and and the standard there is cloud in it, whether we like it or lump it. Um, do you have like, you saw you did a live demo, so I'm going to ask you if you could actually, can you pull up like what it looks like, or do you have UI for customizing the, specifically that cloud in it or comparable stage in an image build? Like, I don't uh, think we have okay. uh, UI for that yet. Yeah, yeah, um, we don't have UI for that yet. Yeah, that's one but of the... But yet, yeah, that is, is considered and is part of the effort? Yes. Um, I know that there's, I mean, there's supposed to be somewhere where you can drop in a, I, I don't know, CloudNet configuration or something like that. Right. It's pretty trivial to drop a file into play 
place um, or to yeah we're going we're considering that and we would love for you to come tell us what you think that should look like because we don't really have a good sense of what people expect there um, what they would expect to uh, it, how to it's kind of like a contract and, and cloud in it is really wide open um, but what it would be nice to be able to do is to look at an image at, at some point and say this is what the cloud init on it expects this is the contract for what you have to fill in when you then go say you upload it to glance and for OpenStack, when i deploy this image before i do i better consider these things the the standard for instance is that um, i'm going to do pki and i'm going to ssh into the machine where it's done so i better provide a uh, a, a key pair mm -hmm. right well that actually is provided via cloud init and it's just known that that's the way that it works whereas if there is some way of first of all specifying here on the on the vm that this is the the, the, the cloud init modules that we're putting in there and they might be that they are beyond the art just drop an rpm in there uh, but this is this is what i'm going to actually allow in there it's a configuration file what you mm -hmm. enable or what you would ignore for perhaps security reasons right and then to be able to query that and say this is this is what it is so that kind of uh, information it sounds like you're thinking along those lines I th yeah. that sounds great yeah what uh, we have uh, right now for uh, adding sort of arbitrary um, uh, content to the image yep. is um, so you may have noticed that when you're working on the blueprint it had you know you commit your changes right. on the back end it's just a git repo that we're putting them in so there is actually mm -hmm. like a back timeline um, you can add other stuff to that git repo and during the image build we put that into an rpm and install that rpm into your image oh, so cool. you can just lay down whatever files you want wherever you want pretty easily um, so like there's a hook where you could probably do the cloud in it thing you want here but we really do need better information about um, what common options or things people care about when they're like, I use CloudInit to set up these things, like what that UI would look like, what sort of questions we would be asking. And that's what we need to know more about. So there's the technical feasibility of it. Yeah, sure, you can do whatever you want. Right. And uh, But like, how, how can we help you make sense of this is the more uh, interesting and complicated question. Does that make sense? Yes, very much so. Very much so. Um, on the, to, to extend that question a little bit, I mentioned CloudInit, but we're moving into a core OS world where that yeah, stuff is done ignition? ignition, which is okay. earlier. It's similar. It's really, really similar. So is the abstraction going to be like one or the other? Here's the configuration thing as opposed to cloud in it. Yeah. Have we thought in terms of multiple stages for that? Because it's kind of um, the same problem with Anaconda. We, we like it. We've thought about it, but yeah, we still don't have clear ideas about okay. like does everybody in the world use cloud in it or do they want other options? So we're um, we're sort of approaching it from a let's see what people ask for and see how what we can do a good job of. Um, yeah, if I understand so, it, Core, yeah. Core OS started off with Cloud Init and then moved it to Ignition because yeah. they needed more. Yeah, they needed to do some more stuff. Bring so. back to you just because one other question on you talked about you used the word manifest earlier, mm -hmm. which is interesting because you have blueprints which say this is how I want to build it. And if, right. you, if you use the word manifest in an airplane mode, it's actually who are the passengers who actually loaded the plane as right. opposed to the passenger list. Yeah. And so you talked about making these things reproducible. Is is there an artifact which says, and separate from like do an RPM query of this is from from like I asked for HTTPD, I got HTTP dot blah blah blah. Can I build that actual manifest and use that to rerun the blueprint more explicitly to reproduce that stage? Um, yes. Uh, okay. It's awesome. all sort of implicit in the UI, but yeah, um, we do write out a uh, we do write out a manifest that has the exact, or I think we do, uh, has the exact versions of what went in. Uh, to that stage, and um, OS build keeps, uh, yeah, has it keeps its inputs. So um, somewhere in there, yes, there will be an actual manifest that has the actual listing. And yeah, uh, we don't expose that in the UI anywhere, right? Now I don't think we, we don't expose it right now. But yeah, it would be a thing that you could fetch and then feed into other stuff. Is the intent there? So you may have already mentioned this, and if so, I apologize. But you, so OS build is kind of meant to build images retroactively, right? Sorry, or reproduce again? builds retroactively. If I knew from the start that I wanted to build, say, an AMI and a QCOW image, could I do both of those in one step, or would I have to build the first and then go back and build the second? Um, that's an that's an interesting question. Um, in the UI, a, anyway, there, you yeah. have to do them as separate things. Um, there is a CLI for this um, that uh, so you could kick off both of those at the same time. Um, 
And the in the the problem is with Anaconda, they're two totally separate builds because Anaconda starts from you know basically booting up a, a machine. Um, with OS build, we would be able to do both of those at the same time in theory. Um, but uh, in practice. This is one of the uh, interesting UX problems, is in what order do we ask these questions? Um, we don't ask you what kind of image you're going to build at first, because it's not really relevant until you're actually building an image. But in theory, we could do that earlier. Well, so at, at this point in time, like this is um, the work that Jacob's currently doing, where we, we do ask you what image type you want to create. And if you choose a specific image type, you might have other upload options available to it. So I guess my question for you is, like at the time that you are building this image, it sounds like you would want to be able to kick off multiple image files from this creation process. Is that, do I understand you correctly? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting. That's not something, a use case that I considered, but it's it's definitely an interesting one to, to consider for this. So as I was walking in, I think you mentioned the problem that often you'll go to repeat a build of an image, but the package, the RPM package repo no longer has that old version of an RPM. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So I work on a piece of open source software called Pulp that I think I might suggest would solve your problem. What you could do is instead of directly downloading those RPMs from the repo, uh, you would set up Pulp. And Pulp, or well, Pulp is used for, is it manages package repos. It's commonly used to either create your own or to sync or mirror one from the internet or whatever. In both cases, it can create ver keep ver old versions or snapshots of those repos. So the idea is whenever you, when you go to retrieve those RPMs, you'd instead say, hey, Pulp, get all the metadata for those re this repo at this current time, and then a lazy sync of the RPMs that you request. So for a pa package repo like, uh, like Apple, it'll uh, sync the metadata for all 10,000 packages, but then the packages you requested, like uh, uh, 200, would be kept on disk permanently in that version. Yeah, there are, um, <clears throat> sorry, yeah, there are definitely various tools that do this sort of thing that will like, that will work around the fact that the RPM ecosystem we designed drops packages randomly. Um, there are, yeah, there are a few ways to work around that problem. And yeah, um, I, I've heard good things about Pulp. Um, but if, if I can rant for just a second, why don't we just fix that and not throw out packages just because they're old um, would be my suggestion. This is one of the things I'm going to be talking about or trying to start on the Fedora develop list soon. Um, the reason that they disappear basically from the mirrors at this point is that uh, it gets really big over time because RPM is a terrible uh, storage format um, it's for a lot of very, very similar data. So we might need new a, rep a new repo format. Um, but if we had a different repo format, like the I've been running some tests, and uh, if you have a repo format that deduplicates at the file level of the content, you can store every everything. Uh, all of Fedora 29, um, every package that's ever been released for Fedora 29, takes 15% less space than the current repos do if you're deduplicating de at the file level. So like, there's no technical, the, the only technical reason that we have to throw out old packages is because it makes the metadata too big and it makes the repo itself very large and the mirrors are getting really mad at us. But all we need. Exactly. Yes. The, the main problem that we face is the image building as a first class use case of the RPM ecosystem and of Anaconda. Like, it wasn't really designed for this. So we're having to find these places and try to fix them. So yes, um, I think OS Build currently are, has a way of making sure that it is holding the data that it needs for the blueprints that it knows about. Is that, did I just make that up? I'm not sure. OK. Don't quote me on that. I just made that up. OK, that's fine. Um, that's, a, that's a dream I had, and uh, please don't. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, my, don't, my dreams don't yet turn into code automatically, so you might have to wait on that one. Um, but yeah, I do want to fix the sort of deeper problem of like why we get rid of packages at all. Um, you know, I secretly just want to write a new package manager in Rust, but they won't let me just do that, so I'm finding an excuse this way. Interestingly, the um, I'm sorry I'm going off way on a tangent here, but the um, the repo format that I'm playing with looks a lot like SquashFS um, because SquashFS does some. No. 
Yes. No. Right. It would be cool if, if our file format was like not designed for putting on tapes. Yes. Like, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the other things is that it would be nice if you could download individual files rather than having to download the entire RPM payload and then install it and then frequently install the entire payload and throw out all but one file because you don't want you know you only wanted one thing. The amount of data, the amount of time and data that we waste in the way that we do things now is absurd. Something like 95% of all of the data you download when you update your system is thrown out or duplicated elsewhere. It's, so there's a lot to do there to make image building more reliable. So like we've done really, really well with the tools that we had, but to make this reliable, reproducible, safe, fast, efficient, we're going to have to do some weird stuff. <laughs> so uh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Squatchfest would do would Yes. Well, yeah, so going f yes, uh, the idea is basically to have a repo that looks sort of like a git pack file, content addressable, um, but with small binary indexes, uh, deduplicating at file level, probably doing um, binary diffs of files because every build is like 99% the same data as the previous build, so why do we store a complete copy of the package every single time? It, it adds up really quickly. Um, so yeah, that, there is a whole lot of talk that will have to happen on Fedora Develop List and elsewhere about these things. Um, if you're interested in the, attacking those sorts of problems, please do come talk to me because that's, yeah, that's the big challenge is making those sorts of systemic changes. Yeah, so I think, going along with what you're saying, I think when you said deduplication, you mean like complete identical RPMs or doing the fact that you, you know, this, pa this newer version of RPM is the contents have only changed a few percent. I'm sorry, can you say that again? I didn't. When you talked about deduplication, are you referring to the fact that across the repo, you know, this, are you referring to the fact that like this package got updated, it's 100 megs, but only like one megabyte changed across versions? Right. Yeah, I mean, like deduplicating like store block storage or whatever can't help with that too much because it's all within tar.gz or tar.xc. Right. Uh, yeah, keeping the un it's unfortunate that the way that we store the data makes that a hard problem. It doesn't have to be. A, it's not actually a hard problem if we don't store our da data in RPMs. So right. we just need to like store it in something slightly different that could be converted to and from RPMs. Maybe um, is the sort of idea. Uh, but yeah, deduplication at the file level isn't super hard to do. I mean, that's what Git does. It's a well-studied problem. It's really pretty easy to do. Um, you know, we can make stuff that's RPM compatible without being RPM. And right. I mean, yeah, it's kind of amazing how much of the container world is just moving tarballs around. Um, it seems like we'd have a better uh, story for some of these things about how you make images and construct them and put them together, and we just don't. So somebody's going to do it. Anyway. What's that? Yeah, so OS3 is OS great, but it's... Uh, but... OS3 is designed for specifically for the use case of having multi like it, it wants to be on disk. Uh, it wants to use hard links and it wants to be on your disk. It's not a great um, repo format. It's not something you want to put on mirrors, um, you know, because every time you update, you have to do like 15 million requests to get all because it's per file and. S3 kind of gets, or if you try and put a OS3 repo on S3, it gets really weird because it uses you know 15 million buckets or whatever. So it, the current that stuff, that idea, the OS3 idea is sound in how you store the data, uh, but they left out, you know, you got most of Git, but you left out the pack files. Pack files actually are a good idea, and RPM, ugh, that's not a good pack file format either. So yeah. Well, Oh yeah. I'm, yeah. Oh yeah. No. Yes, and RPath inspired, uh, interestingly, Solaris when they rewrote their packaging system, which puts all of their packages into a big content store where they address all the files by their hashes, and they only download the files they need. Weird. Um, so yeah. Once again, I'm stealing ideas from Sun to fix our packaging, which is exactly how we got RPM 20 years ago. 
sorry, I think. I don't know. The sun, the sun guys I've talked to are not mad at me about it, so. <laughs> Although it is funny to talk to them about like some of these things, because that was a very large change. They changed their entire packaging system um, to like this totally different thing. And I said, I was like, the, the, what did the customers think about that? Like, can you just do that? And they're like, yeah, it's fine. And I was like, we can't really just like change the entire system in the open source world without anybody yelling at you. And they're like, yeah, we know. It must be hard for you. I'm like, they're kind of smug. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Various places. Um, were there any other questions? Anybody else just want me to like rant about RPM or further follow-ups? Can't we have like four it. minutes left. How much time? Four minutes. Four minutes. Yeah. Was there was there anything else? Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Hold up, we have one more question. Oh, yeah. Wasn't wouldn't Delta RPM solve this problem? Like, couldn't you keep <laughs> old Delta RPMs? Um, I propose we not I, dig too deep into the theoretical challenges yeah, of package I don't management get too deep into that because stuff. really that's completely different than image building. Yes. Also, um, fuck Delta RPM. <laughs> It is, it is terrible. I, come find me and buy me a drink, and I will rant at you about how terrible Delta RPM is. Uh, conceptually, yeah, that would fix the problem, but the implementation is so bad that I have nightmares about it. So, anyway. Any other questions about Image Builder? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, then. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. And if you're around tomorrow, come talk to us out in the lobby. Yes. Yeah. Please. And a reminder again, I know I showed you already, but we have to clear the, the whole area of this room. This is in line.